Please welcome Dr. Eric Sands. All right, well, thank you, Rodney, and thank you all for, uh, for hosting me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, very first time uh, in Kansas, um, so uh, this is first impressions for me. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm already taller right now than I thought I'd be in the entire state. Uh, <laughs> um, so this, this is new. Um, I should say right off uh, that there is some heroism uh, involved in writing a book on Lincoln and living in Georgia. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and uh, uh, that that has uh, raised a few eyebrows uh, over time. I should also say, since this is uh, a Second Amendment presentation, I'm not carrying um, uh, to get that out of the way. Um, the uh, uh, Second Amendment uh, stuff is is stuff I've been working on for about ten years now. Um, this will be eventually published in a book. Um, once it's all put together and uh, all the pieces have, have uh, been nailed down. Um, but this is just going to be a snippet of uh, some of the information um, that's going to be going into that book uh, later on. And um, this is a, a history of uh, how we have come to interpret the Second Amendment, uh, how the, uh, the contemporary Supreme Court uh, interprets the Second Amendment uh, and uh, where we're sort of headed uh, in terms of Second Amendment law and um, the lingering questions about what exactly is going to be allowable and what is not going to be allowable in the way of firearms regulation uh, in the future. Um, so, um, just by way of a little background, um, Firearms uh, themselves use energy uh, created by rapid burning of chemical compound uh, called gunpowder uh, to launch one or more projectiles out of a metal tube called a barrel. The firearm is fired by pressing the trigger with your finger. Typically the trigger's movement causes a spring-loaded hammer to fall, striking a firing pin that ignites a primer in the cartridge. The impact of the firing pin will ignite the cartridge and the gun, of course, will fire. Now, some people loosely refer to cartridges as bullets, but this usage is actually incorrect. A bullet is simply the projectile part of the cartridge, and for all intents and purposes, it's just a shaped piece of metal. Um, a modern gun cannot fire unless it is loaded with properly sized cartridges, not just bullets. Cartridges are generally designated in ways that indicate the diameter of the bullet, either in millimeters or in parts of an inch in the English system. The number of digits used varies. For example, 0 .223, 0 .30, 0 .305, 0 .458, and .50 are all rifle calibers measured in inches. They are listed in order of increasing diameter. Among the metric rifle calibers are 5.56 millimeter, 7 millimeter, 7.62 millimeter, and 12.7 millimeter. Again, an increasing diameter. The primer and the gunpowder inside the cartridge case provide the chemical energy that launches the bullet from the gun. The primer is like a chemical spark plug. It is located at the base of the cartridge. When the primer is struck by the firing pin, it ignites with a sudden hot flash. The primer's flash ignites the gunpowder, which then burns rapidly inside the case, creating an expanding mass of hot gas that pushes the bullet out of the cartridge case, down the barrel, out of the gun, and to the target. The kinetic energy of the bullet is mainly a function of mass and its velocity. It is important to realize that the same size bullet can sit atop cartridge cases of various sizes. The larger the cartridge case to accommodate more gunpowder, the greater the bullet velocity. Because rifle cases are generally longer than handgun cases, rifle ammunition usually has greater energy than handgun ammunition. 
In a modern handgun or rifle, the barrel is rifled. That means that its inside surface has been cut with a pattern of spiral grooves that cause the bullet to spin around its long axis as it travels through the barrel. This spin makes the bullet fly in a straighter path when it emerges from the muzzle of the gun. And rifling, of course, goes all the way back to the Civil War when we first started rifling gun barrels and uh, uh, union uh, production facilities were reluctant to produce these guns because they were worried about them falling into the hands of southern soldiers um, and having them being used against the union army. Uh, so they were actually reluctant to uh, produce these guns initially. So most modern firearms are repeating arms or what we call repeaters. In other words, they can be fired multiple times before it is necessary to manually insert more ammunition into the gun. Repeaters mean simply that the gun holds more than one round of ammunition. It does not mean that it fires multiple times per trigger pull. A gun that shoots more than once per trigger pull is called fully automatic or a machine gun and in almost all cases are banned for civilian use. This is a very, very common misconception in the debate over assault rifles. Um, I have heard congressmen in Washington refer to assault rifles as being fully automatic, and of course they are not. They fire one bullet for every pull of the trigger, um, no more than that. Um, Major types of firearms fall into three categories. Um, and uh, before I talk about those, let me just say a large scale survey that took place in 1994 uh, was held and it was estimated that approximately 194 million functional firearms were in private hands in the United States. And in all likelihood, that number has increased significantly since then. Um, some recent estimates put that number at close to 300 million. Uh, current surveys also indicate that about 54% of American adults own a gun, meaning that about half of all Americans are armed. The first of the categories of firearms are handguns, and the handgun is the most controversial category of firearm primarily because of its portability and its concealability. Approximately 70% of all firearm murders in the United States in 2008 were perpetrated with handguns. The handgun's characteristics also make it the overwhelming choice for self-defense. In 2009, American manufacturers produced almost 2.3 million handguns for domestic sale. Of the 14,180 murders in the United States in 2008, 9,484, about two-thirds, were committed with firearms. And of those, at least 6,755, or 70%, were committed with handguns. Surveys of prison inmates who were armed with a firearm during their offense um, report that 80% said that they were armed with a handgun at the time. Pistols break down into two types, the semi-automatic pistol, which accounts for about four-fifths of all new handguns produced in the United States. Handguns of this type feed ammunition from a detachable magazine that is usually inserted into the gun's grip. Semi-automatic guns fire only one round of ammunition per each pull of the trigger. Each time the gun is fired, the semi-automatic action uses part of the energy of the combusting gunpowder to automatically eject the spent case, recock the firing mechanism, and load a fresh cartridge into the firing chamber. This is why semi-automatic guns are also often referred to as self-loading or auto-loading guns. The semi-automatic pistol has become the dominant type of use for military issue, law enforcement, self-defense, competitions, and informal target shooting. And then, of course, we still have revolvers. These first commercially successful revolvers were produced by Samuel Colt in the 1850s, and they are still popular for many purposes. 
These handguns carry their ammunition in chambers cut into a revolving cylinder that is located behind the barrel of the gun. Pressing the trigger rotates the cylinder and causes the next chamber to come into line with the barrel and hammer. As the trigger reaches the final point of its rearward travel, the next chamber has locked into place in alignment with the barrel. This design has actually changed very little since the 19th century. Revolvers are sometimes preferred because they are simpler to use than semi-automatic pistols, but they do have the downside of holding less ammunition and they do take much longer to reload. Their market share has dropped to about 20% of the U.S. market as of 2006. The second category of, of firearms that we talk about are rifles. In 2009, American manufacturers produced slightly over 2.1 million rifles for sale in the United States. In addition, over 600,000 were imported to the U.S. from foreign countries that year. Of all firearms, rifles are least commonly used in violent crime. In 1997, interviews of prison inmates uh, only indicated that 1.3% reported being armed with a rifle during their offensive conviction. However, due to their greater power, rifle wounds are more likely to be fatal than handgun rounds, and a rifle allows accuracy from a greater distance. Rifles break down into two categories, bolt action and semi-automatic. With bolt action, you had them introduced as military weapons in the late 19th century, but they are now most commonly used for hunting. Approximately 44% of the rifles purchased in the United States in the first four months of 2010 were bolt action rifles. With fewer moving parts, bolt-action rifles are usually among the most reliable and accurate of rifle types. About 42% of rifles sold in early 2010 were semi-automatic. A semi-automatic rifle functions in a manner similar to a semi-automatic pistol. Semi-automatics are easier for many people to use because their recoil is less than that of other guns in the same caliber. Some semi-automatic rifles have the appearance of military-style firearms, although a big difference is that civilian versions cannot fire bursts or fully all about, or full automatic. From 1994 to 2004, federal law banned these assault weapons, but that ban has subsequently expired. And then a final category of guns, shotguns. And as of 1998, the ATF estimated that Americans owned 66 million shotguns. In 2008, 752,389 shotguns were manufactured in the United States for sale. Behind handguns, shotguns are the second most used in crime. Surveys of prisoners show that about 15% reported that they were armed with a shotgun at the time of their crime. Criminals will also saw off the barrel on shotguns, making them very devastating at close range. Uh, this, of course, is federal, uh, illegal under federal law. And uh, shotguns do account for an unusually high percentage of fatal police shootings um, as well. Uh, shotguns come in a couple different varieties. Uh, pump action. This is the most common repeating shotgun in the United States. The pump shotgun stores ammunition in a tubular magazine underneath the barrel. To eject a fired shell from the firing chamber and load a fresh one into the chamber from the shotgun's tubular magazine, the user pumps the shotgun fore-end back and forth. They are widely used for police work, home defense, hunting, and rural control of pests and predators. Semi-automatic shotguns function like other semi-automatic guns. When the shotgun is fired, the recoil energy or gas released by firing causes the action to eject the spent shell and load a fresh shell into the firing chamber. And then double-barreled shotguns um, are still popular for competition and bird hunting. Uh, they have no magazine, but feature two adjacent barrels that allow two shots before reloading.
high quality models can actually sell for thousands of dollars. Now, in terms of what we would talk about for protection of the right to own guns and to own firearms, it's worth noting to start out that of the 36 states admitted or readmitted to the Union in the 19th century, 28 provided a right in arms provision in their state constitutions. And most went beyond the Second Amendment to clarify that individuals have a right to keep and to bear arms. Currently, 43 states have constitutional guarantees on the right to keep and bear arms, and most have made explicit that these are private rights of citizens. The seven states that have no constitutional provision are California, big surprise, Iowa, Maryland, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, again, big surprise, and Wisconsin. Now, uh, we then usually talk about the existence of the pre-standard and the standard model of understanding the Second Amendment. Um, and the pre-standard model took one of three forms. I, um, so number one, the one approach to dealing with the Second Amendment was to just ignore it. It was just to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, so all the other amendments to the Constitution are there. Um, they all, of course, are, are in force, but the Second Amendment doesn't have any bearing. And this is reflected in a 1991 interview with former Chief Justice Warren Burger. And Burger said in that interview, the Second Amendment doesn't guarantee the right to have firearms at all. The individual rights view is one of the greatest pieces of fraud. I repeat the word fraud on the American public by special interest groups I have ever seen in my lifetime. A second pre-standard model uh, approach is to take the collective rights view. And this view holds that the Second Amendment creates a collective right to keep and bear arms, but the individual person has no such right. This means that the right to keep and bear arms really protects no one and guarantees nothing. Uh, so it's a bit of sophistry. Um, so there's a collective right to gun ownership, but there's no individual right to gun ownership. So who is this collective that is allowed to own these guns? Well, nobody. Uh, and so we just kind of ignore uh, the idea that any individual right exists at all. And then there's a modified collective view that says the Second Amendment creates a personal right to keep and bear arms, but only in the context of militia service. And this has been one of the most common approaches, um, that the Second Amendment uh, effectively holds that you have an individual right to bear arms, but only in the context of service in the militia. So if you don't serve in the militia, you ergo don't have an individual right to bear arms, uh, to keep and bear arms. I'm now, this was all challenged by what came to be known as the standard model, and this standard model was actually cited in the Heller case um, and the McDonald case um, when they went before the Supreme Court. Uh, the standard model was usually credited to a guy named Don Cates, who wrote a book, Handgun Prohibition and the Original Meaning of the Second Amendment. Um, and, uh, excuse me, not a book, an article that was published in Michigan Law Review in 1983. Since the publication of that article, a whole cottage industry of Second Amendment scholars have emerged, although mainly in the legal field. Um, what's kind of interesting about this is very little publication has been done on the Second Amendment outside of the law. Um, so you can find dozens of articles on the Second Amendment in law review journals. But if you go to sociological journals, or you go to political science journals, or you go to history journals, you can't find anything. It's as though nobody has anything to say, or nobody wants to say anything about it. 
Um, but leading Second Amendment scholars, um, Don Cates, as I already mentioned, Stephen Hallbrook, David Kaplan, Joyce Lee Malcolm, Robert Shalop, Randy Barnett, Sanford Levinson, Eugene Volokh, Akil Kamar, Leonard Levy, William Alstein, and Clayton Kramer. Now, a lot of these scholars started with a search for an understanding of where the framers sort of oriented themselves when it came to the Second Amendment and how they came to understand the Second Amendment and its application. And to do this, they started very, very far back um, and uh, sort of worked forward um, through the history of political thought, um, trying to ascertain what historical attitudes are towards issues like self-defense and arming oneself. And they came up with some very interesting answers. Um, they started in the Far East with Confucius and Mencius. Um, and uh, uh, Confucius uh, was said to have, have claimed that to govern a state of middle size, the rulers should mobilize the people only at the right times. The people need to be taught by good men for seven years before they can take arms. To send the people to war has not been, who has not been properly taught is wasting them. Uh, so an idea that you know, people need to be trained in the use of arms uh, before they can be used in an organized context, um, such as uh, an army. Uh, Mencius, who was the most influential developer of Confucius thought, viewed rapacious governors as equivalent to ordinary robbers. Now the way feudal lords take from the people is no different from robbery, he said. Accordingly, accepting a gift from a feudal lord was like accepting stolen property from a robber. Royal ministers should remove a king who repeatedly ignored their warnings and made serious mistakes. And he said later on in the same work that regicide is permissible. Um, and so clearly this requires the people and uh, the ministers to be armed uh, so that they can take such action against the king uh, if it became necessary. Uh, the Tao Te Ching um, uh, cautioned, uh, made a cautious statement about arms saying that they were beautiful, but they are instruments of evil omen hateful, it may be said, to all creatures. Therefore, they who have the Tao do not like to employ them. The superior man uses them only in the compulsion of necessity. Calm and repose are what he prizes. So the calm man doesn't choose to use arms, but he does use them if necessary. Um, which implies, of course, that he has been trained in these arms and he knows how to use or make full use of these arms as well. The Greeks added on their own uh, layers of, of, of meaning when it came to our understanding of uh, self-defense. So Demosthenes um, made the statement, if any man while violently and illegally seizing another shall be slain straight away in self-defense, there shall be no penalty for his death. And it's actually one of the earliest illustrations that we have of the right of self-defense laid down um, in language. Um, and uh, one of the early Greek writers um, laying down this idea that if somebody attacks you and intends to harm you and you kill them in the process, um, you're not guilty uh, and you can't be held responsible for that. Uh, Xenophon, um, a Greek historian, said Athenian law presumed that the citizen militia would possess their own arms which they would use when called to military service. Arms carrying was allowed in the countryside, but not in the city unless there was a particular need. 
So speaking to the idea that all the citizens were part of the militia, or at least all the male citizens were part of the militia, um, but also arms carrying were permitted in the countryside um, and for some limited needs um, in the city. Um, Aristotle uh, repeatedly explained the connection between arms and self-government. He said, in a constitutional government, the fighting men have the supreme power, and those who possess arms are the citizens. As of oligarchy, so of tyranny. Both mistrust the people, and therefore deprive them of their arms. Let us then enumerate the functions of a state. There must be arms, for the members of a community have need of them in order to maintain authority both against disobedient subjects and against external assailants. So this again, a uh, first instance of the idea that to be a tyrant, um, one of the things that you would try to do um, in order to keep your subjects in a state of subjugation is to take away their ability to defend themselves. Um, and so that for a society to be free, the citizens need to be armed. Um, and this, again, uh, uh, parallels to ideas um, that we have today. Um, under Rome, uh, we had the 12 tables, which were the foundation of Roman law. Uh, and one of the 12 tables said, if a theft be committed at night and the thief be killed, let his death be deemed lawful if in the daytime, only if he defend himself with weapons. So an interesting distinction that the Romans made um, when it came to self-defense. So if you come at me at night, I can just kill you. Um, but if you come at me in the daytime, I can only kill you if you try to harm me or you try to attack me with some sort of weapon. Um, la and later on, they had a provision that um, you had to yell out first. Um, before you uh, uh, defended yourself. But as long as you yelled out a warning, um, you were covered by the law and could uh, uh, actually harm someone uh, without risk of uh, prosecution. Um, Machiavelli, uh, famous Italian theorist, uh, wrote in caution that early Roman emperors used weapons control and a standing army to hold absolute power. Disarming citizens left them vulnerable to absolute control. So Machiavelli, um, as you well know from reading The Prince uh, and others of his writings and stuff, you know, exercises in absolute rule and absolute control. Uh, again, saying that if princes want to keep absolute control over their citizens, they need to take away their arms. They need to keep them, you know, powerless to do anything. Um, the Corpus Juris, which replaced the Twelve Tables when the last Roman Emperor was deposed in 476, um, held that the right to repel violent injuries you see it emerges from this law that whatever a person does for his bodily security, he can be held to have done rightly. And since nature has established among us relationships of sorts, it follows that it is a gross wrong for one human being to encompass the life of another. If someone kills anyone else who is trying to go for him with a sword, he will not be deemed to have killed unlawfully. Um, so Romans carrying on this tradition of saying that if somebody tries to attack you or tries to do you harm and you end up killing them um, in, instead, uh, you won't be held responsible. Now early Jewish and Christian thought gave a lot of conflicting messages on the use of force against those who have caused or intended to cause harm. So I won't go through all those examples, um, but you certainly know that through the Bible, um, we do get a lot of conflicting messages on eye for an eye versus turn the other cheek um, and uh, a host of other things uh, that uh, are, are not perhaps quite as clear um, on exactly where we come down on uh, how to respond to the threat of violence to you. Um, William Blackstone, who was probably the most famous English jurist uh, in history, um, 
said that the, uh, the fifth and last auxiliary right of the subject that I shall at present mention is that of having arms for their defense suitable to their condition and degree, and such are allowed by law, which is also declared by the same statute and is indeed a public allowance under due restrictions of the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found is insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression. Right, so fighting back um, and resistance is justifiable um, when society is unable to um, restrain the violence of oppression. And then probably the two authors that were most influential um, for the American founders, uh, Hobbes and Locke. Um, Hobbes and Locke postulating about man living in the state of nature, uh, living according to the original condition um, where we live by instinct alone um, and we pursue our self-interest uh, above all else. And the both men concluded that the primary interest, the most important interest um, that we try to pursue is our lives. Uh, we want to, our self-preservation is what is most important to us. Um, and this works its way, of course, into the Declaration of Independence with its statement of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What comes first? Life. I, um, so the idea of being able to preserve one's life, you know, first responsibility for that is, is government, but if government can't preserve your life, you have the right to take this action on your own to ensure that your life is preserved. Now, early arms mandates in colonial America show that carrying arms and holding arms were not just common, but were in fact a requirement. Um, in most of the states in colonial America, you had laws on the books that required people to have firearms and to have them in good condition and ready condition at all times. Um, uh, so um, some examples of this. Massachusetts adopted a law mandating that all adults be armed. The mandate was not limited to the militia. A 1645 order declared that all inhabitants must have arms in their houses fit for service with powder, bullets, and match. Right. Maryland uh, required that every housekeeper or housekeepers within this province shall have really ready continually upon all occasions within his, her, or th their house able to bear arms one serviceable fixed gun of bastard musket bore, along with a pound of gunpowder, four pounds of pistol or musket shot, match for match locks, and of flints for flint locks. Connecticut, a 1650 law required that all persons that are above age of 16 years except magistrates and church officers shall bear arms and every male person within this jurisdiction above the said age shall have in continual readiness a good musket or other gun fit for service. Uh, New York, uh, every male within this government from 16 to 60 years of age shall be furnished from time to time and so continue well furnished with arms and other suitable provisions hereafter mentioned. Under the penalty of five shillings for the least default therein, namely a good serviceable gun. So carrying with it a fine uh, for not having a serviceable gun in your home. Um, so it's a, a re remarkable uh, state of things. Virginia, 1684, requirement that all free Virginians must provide and furnish themselves with a sword, musket, and other furniture, two pounds of powder and eight pounds of shot. New Jersey, the arms mandate only applied to militiamen which were enrolled, which enrolled all men aged 60 to 16 to 50 in the militia. Such men were required to keep a working musket and ammunition. New Hampshire provided that all male persons from 16 years to 60 shall bear arms. North Carolina adopted a militia statute that included all males between 16 and 60 and were required to keep a good gun, well fixed sword, and at least six charges of powder and ball or pay a fine. 
Uh, in Delaware, every free holder shall provide himself with arms and ammunition. Uh, Pennsylvania had no arms requirement. And we think this is owing to their Quaker heritage. Um, and so uh, we, didn't, we don't find an arms requirement with Pennsylvania. And then a number of states also required arms carrying in public. And in some of those states, they even required you to carry arms to church on Sunday. I, um, so that was the case um, in uh, uh, Virginia. And uh, Virginia explains it in the law. They basically said, what happens if we're invaded on Sunday? <laughs> and, and, you know, all, 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 all the men have their guns at home and, you know, we have no way to protect ourselves. So they were expected to bring their rifles and pistols with them um, to church. Uh, as well. Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maryland, South Carolina, and Georgia um, all had arms carrying requirements um, as well. Um, a lot of this same language showed up in uh, the state constitutions uh, once they were written. Um, I think uh, five of the, th of the 13 states uh, held provisions that the right to bear arms uh, was an individual right um, and another three or four um, connected it to militia service but recognized that bearing arms was an essential condition of being a free citizen uh, as well. Um, now the text of the Second Amendment, uh, the language used is the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Um, so the language of right of the people is used in other parts of the Bill of Rights to confer constitutional protections for individuals. So this is against that collectivist view right, that it's conferring a right to you know, people but not to individual persons. Well, the Constitution does the same thing in other places. It confers rights on the people, but we construe that to mean that they are individual rights. Um, uh, so other examples of this are the First Amendment, freedom of assembly, the Fourth Amendment, the Ninth Amendment, and the Tenth Amendment. And then the Militia Clause is distinct from the right to keep and bear arms, which is guaranteed to the people. Thus, the reference to a well-regulated militia does not modify the right to keep and bear arms. The right to keep and bear arms is not subordinate to the purpose of having a militia. The notion of a well-regulated militia is subordinate to the purpose of having an armed citizenry. So how do we know that this is the way that the framers understood it? Well, many of them articulated it this way and stated it quite clearly. Um, the framers intended the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to arms and the protection extended to two basic things. One was the protection of life, family, and property from other citizens um, or from strangers from without. And the other was the protection from tyrannical government and a preference for a militia over a standing army. So the uh, Pennsylvania Declaration of Rights of 1776 says that the people have a right to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state. Jefferson's proposed Virginia Constitution of 1776, no freeman shall ever be disbarred of the use of arms. John Adams' opening statement on the Boston Massacre trial in 1770, the inhabitants had a right to arm themselves at the time for their defense. Adams also favored a quote from Boccaccio that arms in the hands of citizens to be used at individual discretion in private self-defense is for the good of the country. The North Carolina delegation to the Continental Congress issued a resolution in 1775, it is the right of every English subject to be prepared with weapons for his defense. Uh, Tench Coates, um, prominent Federalist and lifelong correspondent with Madison and Jefferson, writes that the Second Amendment clearly affirmed the people in their right to keep and bear their private arms. 
and he endorsed an individual right to own and keep and use arms and consequently of self-defense. St. George Tucker's 1803 edition of Blackstone's Commentaries. So Tucker annotated Blackstone's inclusion of the right to possess firearms as among the absolute rights of individuals in England, with the observation that in America this right was constitutionalized with the Second Amendment. He went on to say the right of self-defense is the first law of nature. Whenever the right of the people to keep and bear arms is prohibited, liberty, if not already annihilated, is on the brink of destruction. Joseph Story's commentaries on the Constitution included a statement that the right of the citizens to keep and bear arms is the palladium of the liberties of a republic. And then for protection from tyrannical government and preference for a militia over a standing army, Patrick Henry stated the great object is that every man be armed, everyone who is able may have a gun. George Mason asserted that the history had demonstrated that the most effective way to enslave a people is to disarm them. Noah Webster, before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed. The supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed. James Madison in Federalist 46, to these, the standing army would be opposed a militia amounting to near half a million citizens with arms in their hands. Madison went on to say that being armed gave Americans an advantage over the people of almost every other nation. And Alexander Hamilton makes a very similar claim in Federalist 28. Richard Henry Lee stated that to preserve liberty, it is essential that the whole body of the people always possess arms and be taught alike, especially when young, how to use them. And the Federal Gazette of Philadelphia Evening Post on June 18, 1789, provided commentary on the Bill of Rights. Of the Second Amendment, it said, as civil rules not having their duty to the people duly before them may attempt to tyrannize, the people are confirmed by the next article in their right to keep and bear their private arms. Take two questions. What's that? You will time for questions? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so, um, all of this background uh, eventually came to bear fruit um, in D.C. v. Heller, um, and uh, uh, it's a uh, progeny that has uh, come from it. Um, uh, certainly McDonald v. City of Chicago. Um, and uh, District of Columbia v. Heller established firmly that there is an individual right to possess a firearm, um, but also stated that um, that right is not unlimited to keep and carry any weapon in any manner, whatever, and for whatever purpose. Concealed weapon prohibitions can be upheld, as can long-standing prohibitions on possessions by felons, the mentally ill, or laws prohibiting carrying guns in certain places. So there's still a kind of open question as to what types of restrictions um, are going to be allowed to continue. Um, and we have a couple of Second Amendment cases that are working their way up through the federal courts right now, so we may be getting some greater clarification from the court um, on, on what it's doing. And, of course, McDonald v. City of Chicago um, applied the Second Amendment to the states as well um, through the 14th Amendment. And so the states are not allowed to infringe um, on the Second Amendment. Um, at least to the extent that Heller um, protects the Second Amendment overall. So I will stop there and take questions. We, uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to issue one to you. And that is, would you give us a, a current context of thinking when people are saying, in effect, well, the Constitution doesn't really apply like it used to. 
Um, I, I think the, the, the reply to that is I, I, I think uh, it does apply to an awful lot of things that they probably want uh, to have it apply to. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, well, I, I, want, I want free speech to apply as it used to, and I want, you know, uh, freedom of assembly to apply as it used to. Um, but I don't necessarily um, want this right that I don't agree with um, to apply that way. Okay, are there other questions? Thank you for being here. As a history professor, how long do you think the First Amendment will survive after the Second Amendment's gone? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the court, the, the court has opened up quite a bit on its first amendment jurisprudence. Um, you know, they have, uh, current tests in place that, you know, uh, tend, tend to really push back on limitations on free speech. Um, and, you know, the problem is we've only had two cases on the Second Amendment. Um, we, we, have, we don't have a lot of case law. Um, in fact, one of the things they, they didn't do in Heller or in McDonald was they didn't come up with a level of scrutiny that they're supposed to use um, when it comes to, you know, how we review state regulation or federal regulation. Um, you know, the, the, the openness of it was an implication that strict scrutiny was supposed to be utilized, so the court's highest level of scrutiny. Um, but a federal district court has said, no, actually for the Second Amendment you can use intermediate scrutiny. Um, and that case has not made its way to the Supreme Court yet, um, and I don't know if it's going to. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's an important consideration to make because strict scrutiny is really hard to overcome. Um, intermediate scrutiny, not quite as difficult. Whereas the First Amendment, that's usually looked at under strict scrutiny and that means it's, it's kind of hard to overcome um, those types of challenges uh, in, in, in a substantive way and uh, the, the court it does seem united uh, a lot of times behind you know protecting free speech uh, the court is definitely not united in protecting the Second Amendment <laughs> with regard to the outlawing of absolute automatic weapons as I understand still exists the worst series of murders recently had has been the guy with the so-called bump stop. You explained a lot of technical information for us, which we appreciate. How is a bump stop different from an automatic weapon? Bump, bump stocks, you mount them on the back of the rifle and instead of pulling the trigger, you, bounce, you basically bounce the rifle against your shoulder. And as you do that, as you bump it like this, it causes the trigger to get pulled and it causes the, the, the rifle to fire. Um, there has been a lot of press spilled on bump stocks and it's ridiculous. They're junk devices. Um, they, they don't improve, they're awful for accuracy. Um, because it's almost impossible to hit anything when you're going like this. <laughs> I mean, you, you need to be in a, you know, level shooting position and you need to be very carefully aiming what you're doing. So, I mean, the, the, the bump stocks don't, don't really add anything um, to being able to, to fire uh, uh, an AR-15 um, in, in any meaningful way. <laughs> obviously very effective in a dense crowd without maybe the necessity of carefully aiming, but it did have an awful lot of damage. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the shooter did a lot of damage. Um, I mean, I, I, some, somebody, somebody without a bump stock would have done just as much damage um, as, as with a bump stock. So that's, that's one of those ones that if you wanted to ban that tomorrow, I'd have no problem with that. They're, they're useless junk to begin with um, and, and, and not, worth, not worth purchasing. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't really make the, the AR-15 any, any more dangerous um, in, in any meaningful way. You spoke about uh, restrictions and limitations in regards to uh, having a firearm and so forth, uh, including age and training and those kinds of things. Are there really any reasonable restrictions uh, that apply to the Second Amendment, or is it better to just have it pure? Um, I mean, I think there are reasonable restrictions that, you know, can be put in place. You know, so for example, I'm, I'm, I'm a firearms instructor. Um, and I actually think it's a pretty good idea to make sure that everybody goes through a firearms class before they get a concealed weapons permit. I, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's quite reasonable <laughs> to say that you should know something about firearms um, before you're going to start carrying one around in your purse or you're going to start carrying around something, you know, something on your hip. Um, that you have gone through an introductory class on how a gun works, how to disassemble it, how to put it back together, how to shoot properly, how to handle it safely, uh, and all of those kinds of things. So if you're talking about states passing laws saying you can't get concealed weapons permits unless you have the certification um, of having taken a class, Florida does that, for example. Um, you have to have taken a, a class in order to get a concealed weapons permit. Um, I, I think something like that is entirely reasonable um, and uh, I don't have a problem with it at all. I just think if you're going to regulate guns, the regulation needs to have some sort of connection to reality, um, you know, to, to, to actually you know, preventing harm in, in, in some sense. So, you know, a lot, a lot of talk has been about the universal background checks. Um, the reality is there has not been a mass shooting tragedy that would have been prevented by universal background checks. Not one. So what are we preventing? <laughs> what, 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 what are we doing with that as a, as, as a, as a proposed regulation um, other than looking good and posturing for special interest groups. Um, it just, you know, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but if there's, you know, there's good sense legislation that, you know, could actually, you know, uh, uh, prevent, uh, prevent harm without infringing um, on the fundamental right of gun ownership, you know, I'm, I'm open to hear what it is. Um, and you know, to, to entertain that as a possibility. But, you know, you, you got to come up with something better than just, well, we want to we want to ban all guns <laughs> or, you know, we want we want to register all firearms and stuff. Uh, again, how would that have prevented any any tragic sh shooting that's taken place in the United States? Um, I mean, that that wouldn't have prevented anything. Dr. Eric Sands, thank you.